All right, let's jump into it. We are at Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going chapter by chapter. We're making our way through the whole book of the Bible. Um, so how many of you have read through the book of Nehemiah? Anybody here who's read through the whole book of Nehemiah? A whole book? I encourage you to take a, take a moment uh, and read through the whole. There's 13 chapters. Uh, you can do it in, in um, uh, one sitting if you are a, um, probably do it in an hour, reading through those 13 chapters. Um, if you read slow, you can break it up. If you have, a, if you're sort of ADD, then you can just uh, come back, read, you know, take a break every once in a while. But, um, but I encourage you to read along with the Word of God as we're preaching on it, because God will be will do a transformative work in your life and it'll just prep you uh, for as we preach. Um, all right, so today we're going to jump into it pretty quick. We got we're going to do some communion at the end. And we're going to cover a whole chapter uh, in one sermon. You ready for that? Uh, if you have a Bible, you can bust it open to ne Nehemiah chapter 8. Otherwise, most of the notes will be on the screen. Today's uh, sermon's topic, this is church. So Nehemiah now has finished building the wall. But now he wants to just turn his focus towards what's inside the wall. The purpose for the wall. We build our lives. We build a structure for our lives. We we put our lives together and get things in order. You know, get a job. You know, get a, a husband or a wife or a place to live or whatever. You know, we have all these things that that we structure our lives around. But the question, at, let's just say, as a church, we have a church building, a place to meet. That's important. But what's more important than the structure is who we are inside that structure. What do we accomplish with that structure? Because you're not just placed here on earth to you know, rent a place for uh, 30, 20, 30 years, die, and then turn it over to somebody else. Or buy a place you know, and give it to your kids. Or whatever it might be. Breathe air, eat food, reprocess that, you know, and, re and, and uh, give it back to the earth. That's not the purpose of your life. Your, the purpose of your life is not just build up a big bank account and then give it to your kids or, or whomever you're going to give it to. The purpose of a church building is not just to be here uh, and, and, and to be the identity of the church. The church... The, the, it's the, the people who meet inside the building. It's us. We're the church. And this is what's important. And so as Nehemiah turns his focus to, to rebuilding the people of Jerusalem, it gives us a template or a model for how we build the church and what the church is supposed to be about. And so today we're going to learn a little bit about ourselves. We're just going to walk through Nehemiah chapter 8 and see how those lessons apply to us. Because that's the point of getting to Scripture. It's not so that we become more knowledgeable and, and more wise and, and uh, more, uh, you know, no more right and wrong than everybody else. In fact, the Bible in, in Genesis chapter 3 says, God says, actually there's one thing you got to look out for. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so as Christians, that's not our main thing is to know good and evil. In fact, that's the thing that God says, look out for. It's the, one, it's the very first sin, that, the first prohibition that God ever put upon humanity. Was he said, don't eat, don't spend your life eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if that's our goal in looking in the scriptures and the way that we live and the way that we conduct our Christianity, then actually we miss the point. Because God's intention is that we have a relationship with him. And that our lives as Christians and as a church and in following the scripture is to, ha to walk in relationship with him. To learn that he's always with us and so we learn to be with him. I often talk about how uh, uh, when I got married to my wife and still to this day, you know, there's times when uh, as we walk, you know, through the subway or, you know, through the streets of Taipei, uh, I get back and she says, you know, someone's kind of living single again. And, and I'm just out there. I, I like walking fast. I, I've always liked to walk fast. Uh, I go to cities with, with my friends, don't know where I am, but I'll just, I'm out in front walking, you know, you know where you're going? No idea. <laughs> I'm just walking fast. Don't know where I'm going, but I'm getting there fast. I do that, and I leave her behind. And then I got to stop and slow down. So, oh, yeah, where's my wife? I'm married. Um, it's not that I stop being married. It's just that I live like I'm not married. And I become unaware of her presence in my life. And we do that with God so often. He's always with us. That's a Bible promise. That's a, that's a, a universal reality is God is everywhere. That's who he is. He's omnipresent. But our awareness of him comes and goes based on us. And so part of what, as we get into the word, it's to learn to, to be present with God. That's the point of scripture is to teach us to be with Jesus. 
And then it's to teach us to become more like Jesus because he's our model. We're created to be in his image. This is also, you go back to Genesis, it's what we're created for, to be with him and to be like him. The Bible teaches us, and we, and we know the reality is God is everywhere, but the Bible also says that once a day, God would come down in the cool of the day, in the afternoon, and he would just walk with Adam and Eve. And they'd just have a conversation. And that was meant to be the source of good and evil. The source of their morality was meant to be their conversations with God. And for you and I, when we, when we trade in conversations with God as our source of morality for legalistic rules and regulations, it's when we start to get that hard edge and become get spiritual pride and we start to actually get further away from God rather than closer to Him. And so as we go into the book of Nehemiah, the goal is to, as, as we, we learn and study, is to say, how does this apply to me and how does it help me be more with Jesus, be more like Jesus, and, and do what Jesus is telling me to do? Because that's the goal of our Christian life. Is that okay? Are we good? Sort of agree? We're getting there? If, if you agree, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I, I, I agree with him. And if your neighbor doesn't say that, then you say, you should agree with him. Because <laughs> it's just the Bible, right? You should agree with the Bible. All right. Um, so this is church. Nehemiah chapter 8. And we're just going to jump right into it, I think. There we go. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're actually going to begin in the last verse of chapter 7. Because it ends, the, the two actually come together. In, in, when the Bible was originally written, there weren't chapters and verses. Uh, and so we, as, as uh, people tr translated and copied the scriptures and wrote it down, we added verses, verse numbers and chapters and things. And so uh, I think they kind of messed this one up a little bit. But here it goes. Uh, Isaiah chapter 73. Um, but it says, so, so the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and some of the common people settled near Jerusalem. The rest of the people returned to their own towns throughout Israel. And then in October, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. And so at first I was going to throw up a map here and say, here's the water gate. You know, here's the 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 the, um, the walls of Jerusalem, and wh here's what it looks like. Uh, but I find that archaeologists are still confused as to where the water gate is. There's some dispute. Uh, and so I thought, uh, it doesn't matter really where it is at this point, but uh, you can get your own map. Uh, go online. Google is great. Um, and then you can see, and you can choose where you think the water gate is. But we know that that's where they gathered. And here's what happened is they had been... All, they had finished building the wall, and everybody had actually returned because when they built the wall, people from all the surrounding areas also came to help build the wall. But now everybody had gone back to their homes and were going about their lives, and then they, Nehemiah gathers them all back together again. And so they come, and they're all gathered there in front of the water gate, okay? When, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled with unified purpose at the square, just inside the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. And so this is the people saying, Ezra, now Ezra was one of the leaders, and he was a, a, a scribe. So he was one, one of those guys who wrote scripture and wrote, made copies of the scripture and wrote down teachings and was his, his whole focus. Ezra was to memorize the word, to know the word, and then to share the word with others. That was the focus of his life. You can get that if you go back to his book, Ezra chapter 7, uh, the, the book preceding Nehemiah, where Ezra writes about himself in Ezra chapter 7. He says, you know, I, I, my goal is to know the word, to, to write it down, to memorize it, and to share it with others so that the people of Israel can be doers of the word. And so here now, the, the people of Israel, um, historians tell us it's probably about 50,000 people who'd gathered there at that time. Uh, and, and so this huge crowd of 50,000 people coming, and, and they say, Ezra, we want to hear the word of the Lord. And so that's what we're looking for. Instead of on Sunday mornings, me getting up and say, okay, I got something for you to listen to. We're looking for you to have the heart to say, we want, we want more. We have a hunger and a desire for the word of God. These are people who love the word of God and had a desire for the word of God, but they didn't know the word of God because for years, they didn't have like Google, they didn't have, you know, um, 
for iPads or, or phones. Uh, they didn't have printed Bibles. The, the printing press had not yet been created. And so the, all they had were these scrolls that were painstakingly handwritten. And so all the scrolls were kept in the temple. Nobody had a scroll at home. It was just way too valuable and way too scarce. So they all had to come to the temple to read the word. And since the temple had been destroyed, they hadn't been reading the word for years, 140 years since the temple had been destroyed. And now it's been rebuilt. But it's been a while since the people went to the temple and heard the word of God. And so they just knew we're missing the word of God. We, we hunger for the word of God. It's so different nowadays. I, I don't know what the, the number is in, in um, Taiwan, but I know in the U.S., um, the people have multiple Bibles, and there's so many Bibles available. In my home, we've got lots of Bibles. Um, but the problem is we don't hunger for the word of God. We come to church, and these guys are they're hungry for the word of God. And they're not waiting for Sunday for the, for the church to announce, that, hey, there's church, and someone to remind, remind them Sunday morning, and their husband or wife to say, come on, get out of bed. you got to go to church. You know, their connect group leader call them up, whatever it is. Um, they're like, Ezra, we, we want to hear the word. Okay? So Ezra the priest brought the, law before, uh, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And so it's on a certain day they come together. And I love how it says men and women and all who could understand. So anyone who is old enough, because normally in that society is very segregated. M men, women, and a gathering like this would generally be just the men. And the women wouldn't be there. But here, God transcends cultural norms. And he says men, women, children, if they can, anyone who can understand, all gathered. And he came. And, and it's interesting because you go to read the next verse in verse 3. It says, And he read it for, facing the square before the water grate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. I love how the writer here, he repeats the very same words. The men, the women, and all who could understand. And in, and in, in biblical writing, when they repeat something, it's like, it's like bold or emphasis or like all caps. They're saying, pay attention to this. I'm going to say it twice so that you, you understand this is what's important. And it's interesting that he would choose that as being the important thing out of all the other things he's writing about. Ezra, the reading of the word, uh, reading for all day, half the day long. Uh, he chooses, the thing he chooses to emphasize is that it's everybody. Men, women, children, all coming together. Because that was a very unusual gathering in those days. But that's the gospel. That's the way the Bible, that, that's the heart of God, is that everyone's welcome. If you can understand, if you can respond, you are welcome. It doesn't matter your social class, your educational status, uh, you know, what everybody is welcome. And I love here it says, they read from early morning till midday. I mean, that's a long church service. And that's just reading. That's like no preaching. That's just reading the Word of God from morning till midday. That's like five or six hours of reading. And when this talks about the law, they're talking about the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I don't, have anybody read through those books before? We all bog down there at the beginning of every year. If you're a good Christian, you're like, okay, this year I'm going to read the whole Bible. You start with Genesis, some cool stories. Okay, I got that. Exodus, more cool stories going through the wilderness. You know, then you get to Leviticus and all these laws and rules. And, and uh, most of us kind of start bogging down there. Then you get the numbers and it's just like lists of peoples and names that you've never heard of before and can't pronounce. And everybody's dead by then. They're done, okay? Because Deuteronomy comes around and it's just a retelling of Leviticus. I'm gonna, uh, in case you missed it, fell asleep last time, I'm going to tell you the rules again. We all love rules, right? I'm just going to read the rules they're just And so it just people just never get past that. But they're there from early morning. I don't know what early morning is for you, but till midday. So 5 a.m., 6 a.m. for them, because they live in an agrarian society, you get up when the sun starts to rise, you want to get out to the fields. You want to take full advantage of the sunlight being up. And so for them, that's 5, 6 a.m. till midday. So we're talking like six hours of just listening to it. And they were all attentive to the book of the law. That's amazing. To me, that's the biggest miracle. I mean, for me, if it's like half an hour into the sermon, I'm starting to fall asleep. I got to tell you. It's just like, this is just, uh, yeah, Jesus took naps. I'm trying to be like him. <laughs> but, you know, so, so this is all the people were attentive to the law. 
in, and in our lives, we want to just develop as a church a hunger for the Word of God. That's why we do the daily readings. We're all reading through the New Testament. And we're in the book of John now. I think we're in chapter 10. And, and so every day there's just a chapter or, or, or a part, part of a chapter to read through together. And we just want to develop a hunger for the Word of God like the Jews had because this is church. Verse uh, five, 6 here, it says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord, their faces to the ground. I mean, it was, it was like a very Pentecostal charismatic kind of a gathering. They're, they're, they're answering back, Amen, Amen. Just like our church. You guys are all Amen, right? Just Amen, Amen. If you've ever been in, in, in the U.S., in the South, churches, they love to respond. And they'll just be, you know, as, as you're talking, they'll be talking back to you. Or if you ever preached in prison, right? prison's like that, you know. And you go to prison and guys are just yelling back at you. More, mostly really good, you know. Uh, but they get into it. You know, and the louder you get, the louder they get. Uh, and, and, and so it's just this interactive thing. And, and this is what they're what the reading of the word was like. I, I love how the people were just answering, you know, amen, amen. And they're lifting up their hands in, in the middle of worship. I can remember when I, when I first became a Christian back in the 60s, that was very rare to start lifting your hands. And I remember at first they have to instruct us, you know, it's okay, you can lift your hands. And we're like, you know, <laughs> like that, you know. But gradually it just kind of took, took over the church, just raising our hands or getting into it. They bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord faces to the ground. They got on their knees. I love that I was worshiping, you know, and, and, and you're in the song, all the angels crying, thinking about, well, that's just, in, as you read through the Bible, it talks about how as you, if you get a, a glimpse into heaven at the throne of God, all the angels are constantly bowing before the Lord and crying, holy, holy, worthy is God. And so as we're singing this song, I'm just thinking that picture. I'm thinking, should I bow? You know, should I come get down it, you know? And, and then I look over and there's Pastor Jason. He's already down on the ground. Thought, okay, I'm going to join Pastor Jason, you know? Plus it's in this scripture here, so that's good. We're just like them. But this is what's church. And, and church is meant to be an active expression of our worship. Church is never meant to be just something where we're spectators and we're consumers. Church is meant to be where we enter in and we are a part, we're participators in it. So this is church, number one, active worship. When we come together in church. Now, worship is actually a lifestyle and all that we do can be worship. If you do everything you do as unto God, it becomes worship. If you honor God in it, it becomes worship. If you do it in a way that honors God, then it becomes worship. If you're at your job and you're falling asleep and you're kind of doing just barely enough to, to get by and not have your boss scold you, that, that's not worship. But if we do it in a way that honors God, we do it as unto the Lord. It's the way that you treat the people in your family and your friends and uh, co-workers. If you treat them in a way that, that looks like Jesus, that makes people feel loved and honored, then that can become worship. But formally, this is what we call, when we come together and gather, this is what we call formally worship. And it's meant to be interactive, participatory. So I want to encourage you as you come in, just jump in. If you see someone raising their hands, just try it yourself. You feel a little prompt, you want to kneel, you want to just open your hands like this, you want to you know, sing, just enter in and, and engage with God in these moments and join the rest of the church. Um, the Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, all, all these names we can't pronounce, Shabbatai, uh, Hodiah, Maaseah, Kelita, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, and Peliah then instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. And so what happens is there's a bunch of Levites, who, the guys who help, leaders in the temple. And after Ezra would read the word, then they came around the people. The people staying there, they came to the people. And they started interacting. They said, let, let me explain, break this down to you so that you can understand Okay, so they, they break down the, the word of God. They, they read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. And for us, we don't do that on a Sunday. We don't take time to say, okay, let's down, the leaders come. Maybe we will at some point, just say, let's just do it now. Uh, I know some churches do that. But we do have, we have connect groups throughout the week. And that's where we break it down to say, how is the word of God applying to your life this week? Oftentimes, we'll just use what was preached on Sunday. 
but really you can take any part of the word or any issue in your life and just say, how does God's word apply to what you're walking through? This week in one of our small groups, we never even got to the, 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 the lesson part because we just started talking about life and, and then just praying and, and, and encouraging each other. What would the word of God say about that situation that we're in? And that's what a connect group is, is applying and getting understanding so that we can live out the word of God. Because we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Because if you just hear a lot of information, the Bible says knowledge puffs up or makes you proud. And then we get the spiritual pride. And, and that's the thing that Jesus hates the most is spiritual pride. Those are the guys he was always after. And those are the guys who crucified him. The guys who thought and, and probably knew more of the scripture than anybody else. So they, had, they had the most knowledge of good and evil. And it's a clear picture of why God said in the Garden of Eden, it's not about the knowledge of good and evil. It's about life. And the words that I speak to you, their life. It's about relationship. Because it's, it's relationship that brings life. So we talk about Christianity being a relationship, not a religion. Religion is knowing good and evil. Relationship is knowing who Jesus is. Being aware of his presence in our lives. And doing what he asks us to do. So it's communal learning. It's not just a lecture on a Sunday. But it's through the week saying, okay, how do I, how is the word of God applying in my life? What am I walking through? What am I facing? And, and how does God's word apply to that? All right, communal learning. That's church. Get in a connect group if you're not in one yet. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the scribes, uh, and scribe, and, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people, said to them, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for this is a sacred day before the Lord before the Lord your God. For the people all had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And so this, there's this weeping going on. What, what's, what's happening in, in them is that as they're hearing the laws, the scriptures, and, and, and the, the life that God intended for them, the pathways to blessing that God laid out, they began to weep and repent. It's the spirit of repentance coming on. It's, a, it's this godly sorrow saying, God, what you intended and where we live, is there's such a huge gap. And the ways that we live, no wonder we, the this walls have been torn down and, and our city has been destroyed for so long. It's because the ways that we lived are so offensive to you and so opposite to, to what brings blessing in our lives. We've kind of just lived the life that invites cursing and invites destruction. Because when God says, you know, don't, don't lie, and we live lies, it brings destruction to relationships. When God says, don't murder, and we kill someone, it brings <laughs> destruction to relationships. When God says, don't commit adultery, sleep with your neighbor's wife, you sleep with your neighbor's wife, it brings destruction to relationships. When God says, you don't have any other gods before me, and you start to worship all, the other, all these other gods, it's destructive to relationships and wrecks our lives. See, all the rules of God, they don't bring problems into our lives because we've disobeyed the rules of God. God puts those rules because the things that he calls sin all bring destruction to our lives. And so you can go ahead and, and, and sin, but it's not God saying, you know, because you sin, I'm going to bring destruction in your life. God's saying, you're sinning, that's just going to lead to destruction. As the Jews heard the word of God and realized how much destruction they'd been bringing upon themselves and how offensive they'd been to the God who loved and created them, they just began to weep, repentance. And, and I'll tell you what, the Christian life, there, there needs to be responsive repentance because all of us have sin in our lives. All of us have junk in our lives. There's nobody who lives who, uh, here who doesn't have areas of our life where there's shame, there's fear, there's brokenness. All of us have that junk in our lives. But that's the beauty of repentance is that we can turn from those things. And the Bible says when we repent, God then will forgive us. And he'll cleanse us. He'll set you free from the, from the, the addictions and the things that bind you. He'll heal you from the brokenness that comes from, from living in sin. Number four, and Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods. 
uh, and people with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our God. Don't be afraid. Don't be dejected and sad. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I love what it says here. Go ahead and celebrate a, a, a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. Uh, my wife and I are getting up there in years, and uh, fat foods and a lot of sugar is what everybody says you got to stop doing every time we go to the doctor like uh too much fat in your food uh too much salt too much sugar um but praise god that he doesn't say that <laughs> he says go your way and i love the way that other translation the asv says you know eat the fat drink the sweet you know eat like a filipino or a taiwanese <laughs> You know, or a fast food American or something. Just, you know, whatever is fatty, go, go, go for it. You know, because that's the best part, right? That's always the best flavor is where the fat is. Uh, and he's saying, yeah, celebrate. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. Praise God, we're going to all throughout eternity be eating the fat, drinking the sweet without the calories and without the cholesterol. Amen. So good. Praise God. So it's a time of celebration. See, church is meant to be a place of celebration. And, and, and we, we get so serious sometimes. We get so down on ourselves sometimes. Sometimes we just need a little celebration, a little joy. And, and you know what, turns, what helps with joy is actually it's relationship. That's a source of joy. In fact, just a little experiment. Turn to your neighbor and just say, he's talking about you. Just look at him and just turn to, turn to someone tell him, someone you don't know. It's someone behind you telling he's talking about you. And just look at the smiles that come on our faces, right? As soon as you turn to someone, a smile comes on your face. It might be a smile of shame. It just might be a smile of, of either I smile, I laugh or I cry. You know, so painful for introverts to talk to the person next to them. But I'm glad you chose smiling. But, but see, we're created for relationship. And in church, when we come in as individuals and stay as individuals and we have this thought that, no, it's just between me and God. I don't need to interact. We, we miss the whole joy of the Christian life. It's meant to be lived in community with others. So I want to encourage you, you know, before and after church, look for people you don't know and go and say hi. Don't just stay in your little bubble of the people you know who you're going to see all week long anyway and then you come to church to see them here. Get to know some other folks in the church. All right, so that's your assignment today after church. Once church finishes, go look for someone you don't know and say hi. All right, so um, because it's meant to be joy. Isaiah chapter uh, 54. This is the, these are the, the scriptures from our, um, our capital campaign. It's kind of what God laid on our heart as we began this year. Isaiah 54, verses 1, through and th one 2, and 3. Um, all right, so single childless woman, you who have never given birth, break into loud and joyful song, O Jerusalem, you have never been in labor. And what is he saying? Before you have a baby, while you're still barren, that's when you want to shout and sing and be full of joy. See, there's something about choosing joy before the circumstance. It says, break into loud and joyful song. Loud and joyful song. It means we need to be so excited that it shows on our face and in our voices. I know a lot of times we think church is meant to be, you know, quiet. And, but if you want joy, joy comes by choice and it comes with strength and it brings strength. He said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Some of us, we have no power in life because we have no joy. And we wonder why the Christian life seems to not work. It's because we have no strength and to carry out the Christian life in opposition and to really break through into the joy that God has for us. Because it's the joy that brings the breakthrough. See, if you're just waiting and your joy, it, it, we have this false concept of joy. We think that joy is meant to be a product of our circumstances. But actually, God intends it to be the opposite that our joy will produce the circumstances that we want. But joy comes first. We have to learn to choose joy when we're still barren. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband, says the Lord. Enlarge your house. Build an addition. Spread out your home. Spare no expense for you will soon be bursting at the seams. Your descendants will occupy other nations and resettle the ruined cities. If we wait for the cities to be rebuilt, then we're just going to wait forever. We have to go there and build the, the cities and resettle them. Enlarge the place before you're bursting at the seams. That's why even as, as we move, we're saying, we, we need to get a place big enough to hold more than what we have now. 
Enlarge the place of your tent. We talk about how that's the place of your heart. Are you able to love more than the people you love now? Start to look for people you don't yet love and start loving them, letting them into your life. Joyful celebration. Christian life, this should be the happiest place on earth, even happier than Disneyland. And that's a tough act to follow, but we can do it. At chapter 8, so the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal to share gifts of food and to celebrate with great joy because they had heard God's words and understood them. Share gifts of food. What it also leads to is generous sharing. Not just to consume ourse for ourselves, but to share with others. And this is the Christian life. This is what church is meant to be. Active worship, communal learning, responsive repentance, joyful celebration, and generous sharing. And for, for, for us, that's why we do the capital campaign, is to break us out of this just bless me mentality and say, let's just become, start to become a generous church. Let's become a unified church. The Bible says wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And we're just saying that in this, this capital campaign, as we all give towards that, our hearts come together and God unifies us even as he transforms us. So Nehemiah 8.13 on October 9th, the next day, the family leaders of all the people, together with the priests and Levites, met with Ezra, described to go over the law in great detail. As leaders, and God's called all of us to be leaders, we need to have a deeper knowledge of the word. Because right now, you know more about Jesus than probably most of your neighbors. Certainly than most people living here in Taiwan. And so if someone's going to lead them to Jesus, it's going to start with us who know Jesus. And so as a leader, you just need to know the word in greater detail. Get into the word. The word should create a greater hunger for the word. As they studied the law, they discovered that the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites should have to live in shelters during the festival uh, to be held that month. And so what's happening is they learned that God wanted them three times a year to come together. And one of the, the, the times, that, that very time, when they were reading the scriptures was a time of what they call the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a time when they would all go and live in tents, re remembering the time when they came out of Egypt and through the wilderness they lived in tents. And he said, we want to remember the good things that God has done in our lives. And so once a year, all the people would come and they'd live in tents. Now they've kind of modified that. Uh, so Jews, they just, they, they make a little, uh, like a little stand out of wood and, uh, and then they go have a meal in it or a prayer in it. And, they call, and so in, in this, in October, in New York City where we live and have a lot of Jews, you'll see people all putting these up like in their living rooms or even guys now on bicycles have them on the back of their, their, uh, their bicycle. And so you can just st stick your head in there and give a quick prayer. And then they say, that's good. That suffices. You celebrated, you know, because everybody's supposed to do that. So we used to have a, a Messianic or a Jewish kind of a church there and uh, when they'd meet for Tabernacle, it would set up a, a, a little booth right inside uh, the church, and we'd all get in there and say a little prayer, you know, kind of a thing. And so they're, they're reading it, and they're understanding that, and, they, and says, and telling the people to go to the hills and get branches uh, and, and other leafy trees, and immediately they just began doing what the Word of God said. And what I love about this feast in particular is this, of all the feasts of Israel, this is supposed to be the most joyful feast. But also this feast was meant to be, it was the one feast where not only the children of Israel would come together, but anyone could come. People from other nations could come and gather. So this feast was set aside from all the other feasts in that it was meant to be just a joyous celebration. And it was meant to be open to all people. Anyone who's in the area could come. And so I love that. In our church, everybody come. This is going to be our favorite feast. Eating together, celebrating together, people from every nation. So the people went out in love. They just immediately were, were obedient. Chapter 8, verse 17. So everyone who had, heard, had returned from captivity lived in these shelters during the festival. And they're all filled with great joy. The Israelites had not celebrated like this since the days of Joshua, son of Nun. That was a huge celebration. And this is what happens when we as a church, when we start to, to obey the word of God and start to do what God says, it brings joy into our lives. When we as a church begin to, to live according to and apply the word of God to our lives, it's going to bring us into great joy and celebration. And so we're going to do what, what God calls us to do. What, one of the things that God calls us to do is, is to do communion, to come together, 
to eat of, of the, the, the cup and the bread. And so we're going to close the service out just by doing as a church together. We're going to do what Jesus told us to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And when it talks about proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes, it's not just talking about, yay, Jesus is dead. It's not like, you know, the wicked witch is dead. But it's, it's, it's proclaiming what Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, it's saying, share the good news about Jesus. Every time that you take this communion, it's meant to be a sharing of the good news about Jesus that He's our Messiah, a living Messiah. He died, He was buried, and He rose from the dead. And the blood of the covenant, that, that, that through His death, He made a new covenant with us, that He'll give us new life. That we'll be freed from the power of sin in our lives. John chapter 7, verse 37, 38 says, On the last day, the climax of the festival, this is actually the same festival that the Jews were celebrating in the book of Nehemiah. So Jesus, hundreds of years later, he stood up, shouted to the crowds in the temple. He says, Anyone who's thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. He says, you want to come alive? You need refreshing and renewing? You need cleansing in your life? Drink of me. I'm the source of the rivers of living water. And then Jesus spoke to the people once more at the end of the festival. And he said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And so today as we partake of communion, we want to proclaim what Jesus has done. He conquered sin. You and I can live free from the fear, the shame, the bondage that sin brings into our lives. No more guilt. No more addictions. If you're like me and just grew up with a lot of bad attitudes, God can set you free. That promise is not only for us. We want to turn from being just consumers of the promises of God to being those that share. See, we're, we're called to proclaim to others the good news about Jesus. And my prayer today as we partake of communion is that we more than just us partaking of communion, but that as we think about and meditate on what Jesus has done for us, that it would begin to seep into our souls become such a part of our hearts and our, our lives and our mentality that it would just start to naturally come out of us in our everyday lives. That the people around us who are living in fear or frustration or darkness, shame, guilt, anger, living under broken relationships, the shame of having messed up, that we'll be able to pronounce to them good news. People are just wondering, I don't know why I'm here, what I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm saying Jesus is going to take you out of darkness into light. As we begin to, to, to just meditate on that truth, what Jesus did through the broken body and his shed blood, that would become the truth that's on our lips to declare. Then we become like a city set on a hill that can't be hid. Become like salt that infects the flavor of everything around. So would you stand with me? Let's go ahead and break out the bread. Father, today we thank you for your body broken on the cross for us. And just as Jesus did, we, we give thanks. And we recognize that, that this is your body. It represents your life, your body given for us, broken on the cross, and that the broken wounds in your body, the stripes in your back were for our healing. 
And that as they thrust that spear into your side, the blood and the water that flowed were for our healing. And tonight, Lord God, today as, as we come before you and, and as we eat of your broken body, I pray that you administer healing, Lord God. That if there's a, a, a physical need for healing, relational needs for healing, emotional or spiritual need for healing in our lives, that through that broke, broken body, your broken body on the cross, Lord God, may healing flow to us. And God, may we become then ministers of healing to others. And so today, Lord God, we meditate on your broken body. And we ask, Lord God, through the power of that broken body, may we be made whole as individuals and as a church. May you form us into one body, one loaf of bread to be given out to the world around us. So bless the bread we pray in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. The scripture says that he took the cup in the same way and he blessed it and said this this cup is a new covenant in my blood and that covenant is that God will give you a new heart and through what Jesus did on the cross he transforms us so it's no longer our efforts trying to seek to do good but it all of a sudden it becomes his power working in us that transforms us from the heart out our values begin to change our desires begin to be transformed to become like his so it's no longer us in our flesh, but out of a transformed heart, we begin to follow him because we want to. And so Jesus, we thank you for your blood. And we say, Lord, apply that blood. May it cleanse every area of sin in our lives. Lord, not only the sins that we've committed, but the sin nature inside of us, the things that make us want to think wrong thoughts, wrong attitudes, wrong perspectives. God, may you begin to transform us from the inside out according to your covenant and promise because of the power of the shed blood of Jesus. And so we thank you for your promise to us and we thank you that you are a, a covenant-keeping God, a God who keeps his promises. Give us a new heart. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. Our prayer for you today is that as you go this week, you would not only be someone who recognizes the blessings of God coming into your life, but that we would be those who are a blessing to others, that we'd be like that city set on a hill that can't be hid, like that salt that flavors the lives around us. So the Lord bless you. I want to say thank you for joining with us today, and we we'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Bless you.